Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Join Cycling. Long time no speak. There's been not much world tour racing on offer. Last weekend, we had the Giro dell'Emilia, the Autumn Classics in Italy are in full swing. And Pagaccia won with a five lap solo, the longest solo <laughs> in that race. Well, I've never seen a solo in that race, actually. It's normally a sprint on the last rep of San Luca. We've had Trevelle Varesine rained out. We had Bernocchi, Agostini. They all, they've all they melded into one. So pretty good racing, I would say. Today, we had Piemonte. And this is the preview of Il Lombardia. Should we say, did you follow what happened today, Benji, before we get into that? What happened in Piemonte? Well, I was following the start of the race closely because I saw a group ahead with the legend himself, Alex Aramburu, together with a bunch of other relatively strong riders. And I then entered an airplane and I came out and I came to the shocking surprise that Aramburu did not win. So I'm, I'm wondering what happened during my flight. Well, the race happened. And he didn't win. <laughs> like he didn't make it, I'm afraid. Sorry, Guess where Alec. he came in Piemonte last year? <laughs> was that the... No. Was that third again? Yeah, I think that's where he came third in the sprint of three. And he tried to come... If he could have come fourth, he would have come fourth. Didn't he lead it out from like 600 to go with he yes, It was a special performance. And Pagioli <laughs> actually won. That was when Pagioli came... <laughs> he came out of nowhere to... Uh, yeah, in the Italian, in a, in a week period, he, he scored like a thousand UCI points. But yeah, Armbrew third <laughs> today, he's on 1500 UCI points, so we joke, but actually, Movistar will be pretty happy about that. Question. Yes. It's very weird, though. If we look at the last three weeks of cycling, or at least the last two weeks of cycling, these Italian classics, I feel like we've had a few surprises and upsets in forms of riders and participations towards Lombardia, which we're going to talk about in today's podcast. Because obviously, Emilia, we just said it, Pogacar slapped everybody. On the first climb, Remco went from the bottom, then halfway through, uh, I think um, there was an Astana rider, or it might have been an Astana rider that moved, then Jorgensen and Pogacar followed that, the rest kind of didn't, and then Pogacar was like, well, I'm getting a lead out for an attack again, so I might as well attack from this point. And he whooped it, and everybody was like, okay, I can't follow that. So Pogaccia was off to, a, off to victory. But then the next climb, we see who comes on top in that second group. And yeah, it's the likes of Jurgensen and so forth. But it's not Remco. Remco comes a bit later, abandons at the top, and looks to be touching his eye. Afterwards, he said there was something in his eye. But I also feel like his, uh, he probably just wasn't good enough to follow Pogaccia in the first place. Roglic also in Narnia, and I think there was another DNF from Roglic at Bernocchi as well, Remco tried to attack with 80k to go, tried to bridge towards the front, but didn't really work out for him, and when it comes to Remco, I've got a bit of question marks when it comes to Lombardia as a follow-up because of that, when it comes to Roglic, he's not even starting, so... Yeah, he ended his season. It's no shame, right? I, I, I oh, have he's no... He's not in good shape, I feel he's like not in good no shape. Sh exactly, if you, if you don't have the form, there's no shame in saying, okay, we have to stop it, we have to recover, and we have to focus on more important goals, which at this point is next season, because how would you rate Lombardia between the monuments and how people peek towards it? Well, no one peeks towards it. It's like, are you available to do it in half-decent shape? <laughs> well, no, like, it's, it's now 10 October, everyone's been racing for nine months. Yeah. So it's, yeah, and Pagach is fit and healthy, and so a credit to him in UAE that Vingegaard, not here. Roglic, not here. Remco, he kind of looks on his last legs uh, a little bit, which is no surprise either. He did uh, the yep. Tour de France and then the Olympics and then Worlds. He was, he was definitely not his top shape. So I, I would not expect Remco to suddenly have refound his top shape based on what I've seen in, these, in Worlds and then these Italian classics. I, I've not yep. seen it yet. Because uh, then, yeah, in, in uh, Agostini... He won in another sprint. That was an interesting finish, actually. He beat Gregoire Lapira, and uh, it was Stan van Trick who won, who was in the breakaway in the Bernocchi when uh, Lemon was solo. They got caught by uh, Ruja Adria, who's in very, very good shape. The ball rider, he's going to be their leader in Lombardia, I dare say, although the climbs are longer. Um, but yeah, but also, that's... Let's talk about Adria for a second here. I feel like when it comes to Adria in the past, he started at Equipo Canfarma, if I recall correctly, yeah. 
and we spoke about them first because of weird tactical decisions in in Paris Tour. Remember that moment? Yeah. <laughs> it was like I think two years back or something. But he was talented. He was showing talent in in the moments before that. But then, well, we we get to to Bora and so forth. Okay, they announced the signing. First few bits. Okay, he's showing himself every now and then. But it's really since. Was it the Vuelta where he was surprisingly good at a certain week? The, the second and third weeks, he was really good. He, he switched roles, yeah. switched roles with Aliotti. He was way better than Aliotti all of a sudden uh, when they go in into the north of Spain when it was cooler. And then he's he's come out of the Vuelta, and we saw this also with Athene. Athene's in career shape uh, yeah. after the Vuelta and that heavy workload of all the mountains. Uh, and he's won Wallony first race after the Vuelta. Ten days after, he it's won. Crazy. Ahead of good riders too. He beat Bini, Aramburu, Velens, Champoussin, Blackmore, Zangler on a, on a 2k, like 5% climb. He then went to Super 8, 5th, Worlds. I looked it up. He, he also, in Worlds, he did the fastest last Zurichbuchstrasse of anybody. Rouge Adria. Really? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Something like that. Uh, he didn't. He came eleventh, but he, he was actually stomping on the final little kicker. Emilia sixth, Benocchi third. He's in uh, career shape, and uh, so he's re he's going to be Bora's leader. Maybe it's Lipovitz. Maybe it's Lipovitz. Him and Lipovitz will be their leaders in Lombardia. Yep. But uh, yeah, certainly it's been a decent uh, racing, decent racing this week. I should say, Paulus won in a forty k solo today. He did what Lemon couldn't. Uh, in in Gran Piemonte, and Corbin Strong won the sprint behind. Uh, just to round off those but results in Piemonte. What does that mean? What does that mean? Paolo is getting fourth and first in these dot pro classics for Lombardia, a, a uh, monument a completely where different race. Pogacar shows up, and also the parkour. Like I look at this parkour and I'm thinking, it's a it's a versatile sprinter's finish, really, in in Gran Piemonte. And then yep. Lombardy is completely different. It's two. I'll do the profile now. <laughs> two hundred and fifty-two kilometers from Bergamo to Como, and uh, that's the direction they're doing this year, uh, from east to west. And they, uh, it's hills. And I don't know if Benji calls this medium mountains. It's nearly yeah. five thousand meters of elevation gain. Uh, I think it is medium mountains deluxe. Yeah. I'm going to call it medium mountains deluxe. Like we have a 6k is 5% straight into the Ganda, 9.5k is 7%, 4.5k is 6%, 10.5k is 6%. So it's all gradual. Then uh, a short valley, or no, not a short valley, about a 30k valley. Then they do the Madonna del Gizallo, which will be familiar to you, which is uh, a bit irregular, actually, a bit Spanish looking, that part of the course, the only <laughs> Spanish part of the course, I would say. Then the Sormano, 13k, 6.5%. The last 1600 meters is 8.3%. Descent, uh, rolling terrain, short descent, and then the San Fermo de la Battaglia, which is 3k, 6.7%, which is a narrow... It's where Enric Mas, I think, attacked Poggi two years ago yes. when he won Emilia, and he couldn't release him, and then Poggi dusted him in the sprint, and then, yeah, it is a short descent before the flat sprint in Como. Uh, so, yeah, 5,000 meters climbing. Very, very obvious to me where the main attack point is. Um, yeah. Which is that eight percent mile at the end of Sormano, Benji, or is it before then? Because there's a little bit of rest before then. Wow, well, maybe before, maybe on that segment. Like it's definitely the Coma di Sormano. Let that be clear. Yes, it's not going to be the first weird. kilometer of it either. So it's in the second half of that Coma di Sormano on paper. Because let's be honest, Pogacar hasn't attacked on the most expected places in the last month. Yes. One could argue that it was possible for Pogaccio to attack with to, uh, to attack with 100 kilometers to go because there were four Zurich strasses left, but I was more expecting maybe the third last one, for example. And then here we see Sermano. I don't expect him to go on the Gizalo though. And to be clear, Coma di Sermano, you might remember Sermano, Sermano, Sermano from the from the past of of the Lombardias. To be clear, this is not the Muro di Sermano. This is the opposite side because this way. They're going, they're going the other way up it to make sure we don't go through that same bend that Remco fell into that ravine, right? Uh, I think they're not doing it, but I gotta say I don't know, Benji. Like this route can't yeah. come out. This I, I'm I'm looking at a thing from uh, La Flamme Rouge now saying that the route might be changed. 
because of heavy rainfall. <laughs> so you can call me lazy in preparation or you can call me smart that I just, I'll wait to see what they're doing on the day uh, in Lombardia. <laughs> because well, they announce it the month before for some reason. Like not even the month before. Less. Two, three weeks max? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think Lafon Rouge posted it that there was some news from Cycloweb or something that the Paso Ganda, which is uh, the, the second climb in the race, might be close to do landslides. So, hey, we've given you we've given you a parkour. Imagine what could happen on that parkour, and then adapt it in your mind if something happens towards the the day itself. But even regardless, if they put the Ganda out of the race, I'm sorry, but the matter. favorite for the race stays the same, right? Yeah, the favorite. Very. I've ne we've never. We've never done a monument with a favorite this short. Never, ever, ever. Aramburu. Uh, yeah, maybe the monument to, uh, I don't know, <laughs> the Aramburu <laughs> family world champs playing Monopoly or something in Christmas. But not a cycling race, I don't think. Um, <laughs> lost the, let me check the odds. I, last I saw Pikachu was $1.22. That is still the case. $1.22. We've never seen a, a rider that short for a monument. Not. Van der Poel, yeah. Roubaix, not Pagaccia in Liège even, was not, never that short. Remco neither, and Pitcock second favourite, he was second in Emilia, he's 15 to 1. Remco third, with no form it looks like so far, 17. Adam Yates, fourth favourite, 21, he was good actually in Lombardy, he attacked early last year to set up Hoggy. He or she fifth, 26, so three UAE in the top five, Jorgensen sixth, the 34, Mas 41, Bagioli 41, Van Hills 51, Healy 51, Lipovitz 51, Yates 67, Andrea 67, Sivakov 67, Bardet 81. But uh, yeah, it really, I gotta say, there's there's no. I, I've tried to, you know, sometimes say, ah, oh, we, uh, this could happen, that could happen, this could happen. But um, before, before I say what will happen, uh, a word on our show partner, Join Cycling, who I'm going to see tomorrow, Benji. So I'm in the Netherlands. Ooh. You may wonder where I am. Yeah, I'm in the Netherlands, going up to Amsterdam to see them tomorrow to have a sit down for a couple of hours. We've got some exciting plans coming up in partnership with Join later this year, bringing you some new and different content. And yeah, I'm look, really looking forward to going to have a chat to them. But most importantly, I've been here for two days, been in Eindhoven, then I'm in Den Bosch next week with meetings Monday. Monday uh, to the middle of the week, and so I've had to adjust my joint cycling training plan. Maybe I'll steal a bike from the, the Visma headquarters, actually, uh, to get out on a ride. But I've been running, and so I've had to adjust my plan because obviously I can't run for three hours yet, and so I can do... But still, Netherlands is good for running. 45 minutes in the cool zone two, maybe a little bit of zone two, zone three heart rate when I'm running. Join adapts to it accepts it it's got the uh there was the beta version that introduced running that was really really good for me in particular maybe you're a triathlete maybe you just like to do some cross training maybe you use it for strength training uh and for me i run one or two times a week and that was the beauty of join introducing that in the beta version and adapting so that's what i'm up to this week i just thought i'd give everyone everyone an update some people emailed us benji saying are you guys gone forever <laughs> Have you perished? We, there's no world tour races. We don't. We just we, a calendar. So there's no world tour races. I gotta be honest. That's one of the reasons. But I also think we were both in kind of a moment of okay. We've had we've had Tour de France. We've had Tour de France fun. We've had Olympics. We've had Vuelta, World yeah. Championships, and I was getting on the brink of maybe burning out a little bit in terms of cycling. So I needed a, a week and a half. I went to Germany to Düsseldorf and Dortmund and so forth. Can, can I be honest? I didn't know Germany was so green. It's like a really nice place. Germany? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather live in like the Sauerland region of Germany than in Spain, based on my experiences. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, Germany's nice, but I think uh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> 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 Compared to Spain, on what basis? Based on the fact that it's so much green and it looks ah, like the true. Belgian Ardennes and Spain doesn't, obviously. I'm also, Spain is warmer and I don't know, I like a bit of rain every now and then, so... Yeah, true. I can see what you mean. 
<laughs> but yeah, that's what we've been up to. The Mets have been on a bull run. My my fantasy football team is absolutely crushing it. Um, so that's why, yeah, there's just been a lot happening. Most importantly, the Mets crushing it and, and my fantasy team doing doing really, really well. Uh, but that sort of flexibility is, I, I got to keep on track because before we know it, I'll be back in Australia. Uh, and that's the beauty of the Lantern Rouge plan as well on joint cycling. It's so achievable, so sustainable. It's so non-threatening the how polarized it is that you basically do one what i call real workout a week which i will fit in i did make sure i did it earlier and then i'll be able to do it next week when i'm back in andorra and otherwise i'm just cruising around zone two if you want to check out joint cycling go to the app store download joint cycling free 30-day trial for lrcp listeners and even try the lantern rouge plan it's working for me and we'll see uh as i said we'll see in tdu how well it has been working indeed um Okay, Benji. But Lombardia. You said it. We're gonna go through the through the scenario of what's gonna happen, but I want to talk about a team surrounding Pogacar before you do that. Pogacar, Hirschi, Jan Kristen, Rafa Maika, Fischer Black, Sivakov, Adam Yates. Also, news from today, I think. Maika signs until the end of next year, which is yeah. I love that. The guy deserves a, an extension to his contract if he wants to keep going. He's fucking good, so he deserves that. This team is good. This team is the kind of team that, to be honest, people can talk about, oh, Pogacar can attack anywhere. He, he might feel, he might be like, okay, oh, um, he might do the, the Van der Poel thing. I feel a bit cold on Gisalo, let's go. Something like that. I think they should just keep it simple. Lead out on, on, the, on the Sermano climb, launch Pogacar. Doesn't even matter if you do it on the steep section or just before that descent. He's going to drop everybody anyway. We've seen it a hundred times in the last month. So... Do you, how much percent in your head is the likelihood of Pogacar winning this race? Like a hundred percent. Well, yeah, like no one. That's the thing. It's uh, you can see what's going to happen. They have a, they have the best team. Even without Pogacar, UAE would be the favorites to win this race. If you took Pogacar out, if you have Sivakov, yeah. he or she, Yates, and who else is here? Young yeah, Kristen, yeah. and then you got Fisher Black and Micah to control. They'd still be the favourites. You you could yeah. roll attacks with Sivakov and Yates, and then have Hirschi as the sprint finisher because the final of this is not that hard. Like if he gets over the Solmano in a group two, and then they block behind. So the team is crazy strong. In fact, Hirschi's the strange one. Like how does Hirschi work with Pagacha? I kind of think he'll yeah. just get to do his own thing and just fight for his best result possible. But what's going to happen is. They're going to control the race uh, pretty easily. And then with Fisher Black and, and Micah. Now, maybe it is a bit strange not to have Novak, I would say. Um, that is where I like, he or she doesn't fit for me. I would have probably brought Novak, but regardless, yeah, but it doesn't matter. I think he deserves his spot based on what he's performed yeah, in he's the second half so of the much. season. Solely based on that. So I don't necessarily mind that. And I think they don't necessarily need Novak here be able to do what they need to do in the first place so uh, i don't think it's a devastating blow i understand where you're coming from though but uh, you spoke about the two other uh, i won't call them favorites <laughs> they're outsiders basically bitcock second favorite then we've got a second out no first outsider second favorite according to the betting and then we've got Evenepoel in third if you look at in your surrounding bitcock if i can find a damn list where is any on this list am they i blind at the bottom now <laughs> Does it have a reason? <laughs> <laughs> now nah, Peacock's their leader, yeah, with uh, the Swifties. Who does he have around him? Not much, to be honest. On the provisional PCS list, at least. Like they're Heide not even on my page. Heidek, Puccio, Connor, Swift—they will be gone by. Yeah, the fourth climb. One would think if UAE are absolutely driving it. Um, depends yeah. how hard they race. Depends who's in the breakaway. Maybe indeed they go in the breakaway. But yeah, Pickcock looks in good shape. But these, the thing is, the, the strange thing about Lombardia is, especially compared to, I would say, like E3, Omlope, to me, are much closer to the Tour of Flanders. I mean, E3 literally is the Tour of Flanders with one hour less. Yeah. Copper Bernocchi, to me, they have almost nothing to do with Lombardia because True. this is going to be decided by 
first of all, four climbs, two of which are 10Ks at 6%, so they're 20 minutes, mm-hmm. 25 minutes. And then a 13K, 6.5% climb, so a 27-minute, 30-minute climb. But how much does Emilia matter? I mean, it matters that Poggy's in pretty good shape. Yeah. And, and it definitely matters that Peacock's in good shape. I mean, Amelia is the most relevant because that's where we saw the big guns going against each other. Uh, it's a shame Roglic isn't here. It is a good finish for Roglic, but, you know, he's not in the shape. Anyway, I should, I should finish with what I keep saying what I think is going to happen. Yeah, so this seventh kilometer of Solmano is steep. That is where Pagacha will attack. They'll lead him out on the, the seventh kilometer of Solmano. He will go solo. Um, and that's it. Okay, but we can all talk about, okay, the winner is uh, is decided before the race. It's not really true. Everything can happen, but he's definitely the main favorite. I'm trying to jinx him as much as possible, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to set up a competition. One of us is going to choose a rider to come second in this race, and every single person watching this podcast needs to Lipovitz. go to the comment section and say hashtag Team Benji or hashtag Team Patrick. Lipovitz. You're going for Lipovitz? Lipovitz, for sure. Lipovitz will podium in this race. Okay, I'm going for Simon Yates. Simon Yates? That came fifth in Emilia, didn't he? Yeah. And it was Sneaky terrible one. weather. Is it Lipovitz? So, if you're listening, uh, go to the comment section, hashtag Team Benji, Simon Yates, or hashtag Team Patrick, Florian Lipovitz. What's your choice? Lipovitz is a good one-day racer. He just doesn't do ah, so yes. many of them, but San Sebastian, 15th, uh, some other one day races, top ten. Emilia. What's a sprint? It's group two syndrome, eh? No, no, he's gone. He's gonna go solo and and uh finish solo second. It's possible. He was in front at Emilia for a long yeah. time. Eh? And the longer climb here suits him, I think. Yeah. He probably what about does. Adria. But Simon Yates Sa- is gonna beat him. Simon Yates, yeah. Um any... Adriel's difficult for me. Because, yes, he's shown a lot in the last two weeks and in the Vuelta and so forth. But Lombardia is a monument, a different beast. How many races of 250 kilometers has he done? Worlds. In his life. And Amstel. And he was pretty good at Worlds. Fuck this. Yeah, but the climbs are longer. I don't see him as a good climber, you know? He's more of a five minutes or less. He's a hill rider to me. But what is the difference between a hill and a mountain, medium mountain for you? That's a question. <laughs> I, time. Time. <laughs> a hill is, is maybe under five minutes. This is nearly 30. I, f- I think we need to consider having like merch that like shows the height of <laughs> each thing. A mountain, a medium mountain, and a hill. Because then we're always reminded when I look at you what a hill and a medium mountain is. But the problem is, my hill will be higher than your hill, and my medium mountain will be higher than your medium mountain on the t-shirt. So, we've got a problem here. Yeah, we do need to, we do need to sort out these definitional issues. Uh, Enrique Mas was, was good the other day. I'd love to see him in shape. Does anyone try to follow? Does Jorgensen... That's another question, Benji. Who is the Jorgensen Ooh. they sacrifice themselves? I don't think he's going to do it again. I think he's going to ride for his best result. I think so too. The thing is, I I haven't been able to keep up with cycling media as much as I would want in the last week. There was a quote somewhere from Jorgensen, I think, where he might have mentioned that he might not respond to Pogacar. But him saying that, I'm not sure I can believe that in the media in the first place. So it's kind of like you're saying something. Are you are you like double agenting this or not? Who knows? But from like a logical perspective, how many races has Jorgensen tried to follow Van der Poel and Pogacar this year, where it backfired on him. Ronde van Vlaanderen is one of them. Emilia is one of them. I'd argue at Montreal, you, you could argue as Mont- well. Montreal, you know? for, Montreal for sure, yeah. So that's at least three races where I, where I have that in mind. Even world. So it's time for Lombardia to, to try the opposite side of the coin. And yes, yes, it doesn't show the same oh, aggressive panage and so forth, but remember the words of... Matthias Kielmoser from, from uh, was it LBL? Don't all fly too close to the be, sun. All my opponents should be shitting themselves. Yeah, that's the other quote. 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 Jorgensen still needs to say that before, before <laughs> Lombardia starts. Come on, come on, Matthias. Put the fire Mateo. in the Pogacar. Matthias got a herniated disc. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, true. He does. <laughs> uh, he hurt himself. Matias, um, but I, I'm talking about Matias. <laughs> it's very difficult. Come on. <laughs> Mateo, Mateo Milan, Mateo Jorgensen, Mateo I'm talking Skelmer. about Mateo Jorgensen. He needs okay. to wake up on Saturday and on the pre race interview, look into the camera with like very focused eye. Like you're looking through someone and say, Pogacar should be shitting himself and just walk off. He, sh he shouldn't say that. He shouldn't um, say that. But he shouldn't say that. <laughs> Uh, maybe who who could Maxim van Hill say? Oh, why not say it? But Emko uh, should say that he's gonna get roasted. <laughs> <laughs> David Gadu might if David Gadu comes with his slick back hair and the ponytail and the oh. Ray Ban sunnies, I might be scared of it. Um, and, and I How might do you even say that in French. Panache. Pogacar should shit himself. I don't know. Um, I don't know either. <laughs> my French doesn't extend that well. I'm sure Chris Froome's been called some things in French. Maybe he knows some good... I think he'll know some good <laughs> good, good uh, uh, nasty words in French. Uh, so yeah, my pri so my prize for trying to follow Tade Pogaccia and then cracking themselves is... Uh, Andrea Bagioli. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mine is Lipovitz. He, yeah, I think Lipovitz is a Just good candidate for it. He did it in Emilia, but Bajoli literally did it in Worlds, right? Yeah. So, yeah. and and this is his time to shine this year. He comes into form with no races left. Uh, so I have a important news. Important news. Luke has given us an update. Apparently, in French, it's for Pogacar devait se chier dessus. So I don't know if that's actually true. Huh? Might just be a shit translation, but <laughs> pardon the pun. But uh, anyway, continue. Vive la France. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm keen to watch the race, even though, yeah, my podium is Tadej Pogacar, Florian Lipovitz, and third, I'm going with uh, Mark Hirschi. So Ooh. he wins the sprint of about six or seven riders for third. Uh, no pit yeah, that, mm, He's it's fourth. Weird, eh? He she's quicker. He she got a quicker sprint. He she sprint is nasty. He destroyed Le Pair and Gregoire. My problem is that I do, I do kind of believe in Pitcock after seeing Emilia, so I kind of want to put him on the podium. But it's completely unrealistic for Simon Yates to beat Pitcock in a sprint at the end of Lombardia either. For he could be my solo. Theory. <laughs> I don't know about that. He, 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 will, he won't drop Pitcock on some fan with the Battaglia. So uh, I no. don't know how my theory comes into action, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Pogaccio first, Simon Yates second, Pitcock first. Third. Sorry, third. Uh, so that was our Lombardia preview. Uh, we've been away from you for a, a little bit, so we will do a little uh, other news roundup and, and discussion. Parry Tour was won by the door in gravelly, wet, horrible conditions, yeah. which made me think, Benji, it was such a shame. Like, the door going against Pedersen, a Laporte, sorry, in both in decent shape. For what? You know, it just was again, we need to get the Roubaix to the Roubaix to autumn, just makes so much more sense to me to combine it with Parry Tour. Two things. I agree. I've always been a fan of the fact that if we move Roubaix to autumn, we take Parry Tour as a preparation race, but also GP Dinaire, for example. We, we take all, like, Four French races in similar fashion. We put that before Peru. We pack that up. You've got a second peak at the end of the season for classics riders to show up. You can combine that with Gravel Worlds being after True. Roubaix or something for the people that still want to do that afterwards. But also, isn't it fucking stupid to have Pari Tour on the day of Gravel Worlds in the first place? Yeah. Because, like, you could have even a stronger start. First of all, all the Alperson hitters... What if you got Vanderpool? Yeah. Yeah, the whole Alperson team was... The Classics team wasn't there. So, yeah, that didn't make sense at all. Uh, also, the gravel worlds, I was like, doesn't look like much gravel to me, i got to say. Um, yeah, I agree, but does it also not feel like it's kind of the... In terms of nationality, patriotism, halfway between road racing and... Saga Cross, with, with CX, you've got the fact that a lot of riders just ride for their own instead of for their country in World Championship, is how I perceive it. And when it comes to gravel, I felt like with the Belgian team, that was also the case. Because it, 
To me, it looked like Johnny Vermeers was thinking about Mathieu van der Poel being ahead and therefore not really chasing more than uh, other things. And I don't think they were hiding it either in the post-race interview. So oh, no, they, they, uh, the Alperson guys even said it makes no sense for us to chase van der Poel. Yeah. And they're not wrong, but it's like, then why are we riding these fucking races with national teams to begin with? I mean, to be honest, the gravel worlds and stuff like that with gravel, I hear more discussion about what is gravel, what is the spirit, the spirit. of this, why are we doing this, <laughs> than actually about any of the events. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, it just looked like a flat, like a hard pack cyclocross course, super fast course strung out without any corners in a straight line. And uh, yeah. Van der Poel won. The women's was a bit more competitive. Voss beat uh, V Kopecky in a sprint. But Voss was using that, uh, I think, the Grava technology in, in, one of, in both her wheels that you can like blow up and reduce your tire pressure yeah. during the race uh, based on maybe button pressures, uh, presses or something on yeah, the. Yeah, you press a button on, on the, the I was going to say keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on the handlebars. <laughs> But, like, that is such an advantage for the sprint. On yeah, flat tarmac sprint. sprint. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, sure. if you can bump up those tires, I don't know how to call it, artificially, not really. Like, at, before that sprint happens, you, you're just sprinting with much, how do I say it, much less grip, kind of, eh? Because you're less stuck to the floor. Yeah, with less pressure, you have more roll resistance if it goes down yeah. too low, so... Um, I don't yep. know if what Kopecky was running, or maybe Kopecky was running a high, like the same pressure Voss finished with, but Voss was able to lower her pressure to be more comfortable on the gravel section. I don't know. Um, but, but also, that was the system on paper, she was using. for me, Voss is also a better yeah. spin than Kopecky in the first place. Voss is a, is a, is been really nasty in Voss. two up sprints, small group sprints, yeah, this year. Uh, also, Benji, they could have, even have, dun you, I got some news for you as well. The four days of Ooh. Dunkirk next year. The quatre jours de Dunkerque. Is actually six days. Yeah. But no, but the one day is a, is a, uh, is a one day race to increase the points. So it's a dot pro one day race and then five days in a row stage race and it's called the four days of Dunkirk. Yeah, but it's always been six days, no? Yeah, but not now with the one day race. Like now they're really taking the piss. Like, I understand yeah, you, you expand a stage race a couple of days and you don't change the name from four days of Dunkirk. Now you have a one-day race and you, it's five days of stage racing. Um, so that's so many points in six days because that's, that's the only... I've never seen a dot .pro one-day race straight into a dot .pro stage race. Despite the name of the race, since the addition of an individual time trial in 1963, the race has been held over a five or six day period. Just okay. history, innit? There's no like more reason than that given. <laughs> Thanks to Wikipedia. <laughs> I was <laughs> expecting something like super serious about, about this definition, but no, it's just they added a time trial and then realized, okay, we're still going to call it the four day. Who didn't care? Is it because it's a brand? Their brand is Quatre Jours de Dunkerque. They don't want to change that. It's yeah. like, this is as if the 24 hours of Le Mans were suddenly 27 hours. 20, 27, 24 <laughs> hours of Le Mans. I'm trying to think of another example. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it just made me laugh. I, I saw it on the yeah, it. Three, day, three days of Brugge the Planet. It's a fucking one day race. Like, what is the problem with changing it? Like, it's unbelievable. Um, well, now it's classic, to, right? Now it's classic. But, I, but the reason I bring it up, the reason I bring it up is all these, guys, all these teams in the relegation cycle, they'll be like fiending for it. They're going to see this. It'll be like an addict. Yeah. They're going to see yeah. this. Uh, dot Pro one day, 120, no, more, 200 UCI points to the winner. Then the stage race, 200 UCI points to the winner. Movistar, Arkea, uh, Cofidis, Astana, they are going to send their Tour de France teams to this, these, this six days or four days yeah. of racing. I'm telling you. Um, and that's why they've done it. Even like, I'm thinking like, Visma should go Benji, because then to, uh, yeah, Van Aert? I, 
I still don't care about the the victory at the UCI World Ranking. I'm sorry. <laughs> I care about the 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 emotions. What do you call that again? The degradations, relegation, the relegations. Yeah. And I care about the promotions, but I couldn't give less fucks of which team wins. For me, the best team of the season is the one that gets the best results, in my personal opinion, according to my definition of the best team in the world. Last year, that was Visma Lisa Bike with three Grand Tours, despite you having the UCI ranking. This clear, it's pretty obvious. It is UAE. <laughs> this year, I reckon in we both can do regards. <laughs> this year, I think it's pretty clear. Um... <laughs> Who's the Catalan age, age to well on the yeah. um, <laughs> right. They're most, they're most How improved. About who was the most? Well, we should, we should wait with this. We, we're going to have, are we going to have cycling awards again like last year's? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think we need to prepare our, an awards where we do best team, but also best team relative to our estimated budget of that team. It's a good point. Um, I think so. Yeah, I, th I, th that's a good because yeah, that just is a bit more interesting. Otherwise, we're probably just going to list the three richest teams in a row. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that is a bit. That's an interesting conversation. People can pharma. We gotta stop them. I think Alperson probably, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to do a transfer recap in full. I'll just rip off some quick news. Castrillo is confirmed to Movistar, so they got him instead of Ineos. Uh, Marion Bunel to Visma Lisa Bike, Saint Michel Aubert, uh, Quatre Vingt Treize yes. are continuing, which is really good to see. They got a new co sponsor, but Bunel was not announced in their co sponsorship in the new team, so then it sort of it was clear she's going to Visma. Um, other transfers Gianni Moscon to Red Bull, which was actually quite surprising yes. to me. Given that Lefebvre said in some, what did Lefebvre say in summer? He he said that there was a verbal agreement for him to continue. Um, that being said, I think the obviously Moscon's gonna have criticism for his history, and I can't blame people for doing that. But that being said, performance-wise, Tour de France this year, he kept Remco at the front at the end of sprint stages when it was necessary. He was there on the gravel stage when he was needed. He did a wonderful performance during the Tour de France for Remco. In the meanwhile, Roglic crashed. 8 to 10 riders deep in a sprint stage. So if you can increase the chance that Roglic doesn't crash out of the Tour by 1 to 2%, then it's definitely worth it. And he was on 70 grand this year, apparently. Yeah. So, and like it or not, the reality is, I'm telling you, he was well-liked by his teammates at Ineos when he was there. Ghana liked him. Yeah. Um, quick step two. Yeah, quick step two. Bernal well Giro 21, I remember he was an incredible lieutenant. So... For Bora, sporting-wise, it makes complete sense to me, actually. Uh, and I'm, yeah. I'm very surprised that Quickstep, he did not continue there because Remco, having quality, versatile rulers, he's thin on the ground. Unless you think Pedersen and Lampard are going to do it in the Tour next year. Um, yeah, but I also feel like Lefebvre might be like trying to, uh, trying to like limit how much he wants to pay Moscon as well. While Red Bull might be a bit more free in doing that, I feel like there's a bit of that going on too. Like they're happy to give him two years at uh, 250000 and there's no I would give him that... two years. It's Moscon. Only one yeah. year contract. I'm sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, uh... he's not performing the first of the two oh, years. Oh, that's not confirmed. That's just a rumor. <laughs> sorry, I presented that really? as confirmed. Yeah, I, I took it as confirmed. Maybe because it was an Italian and Chiro tweeted it, so I took it as confirmed. But... Uh... Yeah, that's uh, that's some of the news that's been been hopping about. Otherwise, uh, there was a rumor from Freeb that was a big uh, bomber. The rumor from Daniel Freeb he tweeted that uh, Tom Pidcock or there's interest from Q365 in Tom Pidcock, and uh, yeah, if this was just Luf Lol on Twitter tweeting it or or uh, <laughs> uh, cycling Muse or all big those other people. Account. Yeah, there's, there's Twitter accounts. Okay, uh, we probably wouldn't mention it, but Freeb, English writer, uh, you know, good journo. He says he's well sourced. But English agent, Irish agent, sorry. Outside of the agent stuff, because there's, there's probably some shit happening between teams and not liking that agent anymore and liking that agent because we've had some problems with uh, Pitcock's agent and Ineos in the past, if I recall correctly, when his previous extension happened. But 
that to the side, from the perspective of Q36.5, it makes sense. Of course. From the fact that Inos rides on Pinarello, Spitcock, in my, in my knowledge at least, has a personal deal with Pinarello for mountain bike stuff and so forth, probably for road cycling as well. And then in addition to that, Pinarello was taken over by the, by the, by the owner of the Q36.5 right. cycling apparel brand. What's his name? That's South African Even dude. Glasenberg, he was the CEO of Glencore. He did also the merger with Extrada. He's a South African. He, then he moved to Switzerland because Glencore's obviously was a Swiss commodity house. Where um, is he on the ethical, uh, ethical line in cycling? <laughs> I'd say, he, I say he's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I'd say he's I don't fine. know, like... <laughs> Don't know, I mean, don't know what am I going to say, Benji? I, I, I spent three years writing advices for those companies, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. Yeah. So, Do you miss it? Um, some I missed the really... There were, I remember there was one advice, yeah, a couple of advices that really like technical questions where I just got to... Some of you may know this, but maybe uh, I can get my brain whirring a little bit, and if there's a difficult question, sometimes I was the, the nerd in the corner, you would be like, give it to the guy, and he, he might figure out the answer to this thing no one knows. Uh, <laughs> I'd like doing those things, but the daily churn of it, and yeah, billables, of course not. Of course, I don't miss it. Uh, um, it would be weird, I think, if I did. But yeah, difficult questions being answered. <laughs> and Now the... Uh, now the, now the difficult question on your desk is how to beat Pogacar in 2025. <laughs> <laughs> I've been going to church a lot more. <laughs> nah, it's not true, but yeah, it could be the, I think that's the best solution so far I have at the moment in, uh, <laughs> in my notes app. It's just one bullet point. <laughs> Go light some candles right. in the Andorran Catholic Church in Ordino. <laughs> Um, that's the good, that's the best Where were I've got. We? Uh, transfers, but that's yeah. The peacock it makes sense for Q three six five. It rem really reminds me. I mean, it's a rumor, so we're going to just speculate on the rumor. But um, these teams do this. The pro teams they they come in. Mm -hmm. They have clearly bigger aspirations than being what they are now. If they're backed by a, a billionaire who owns the kit company, who maybe owns and is going to bring in Pinarello, their plan yeah. is not to be what the team is now. And so you can develop riders or you can make a splash. Sagan, Bora, took but, it to the next level. Is this that? Is it good for Pitcock, though? Because from, from Pitcock's perspective, he has more freedom, probably, but in terms of wildcard, with Pitcock in the team, Q36.5 doesn't automatically have wildcards for the Tour de France. Well, but they already got a good one-day schedule. Yeah, but I'm sorry, but Pitcock wants to do more than one-day races. Actually, I'm not sure if he wants to do more. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. Does this, this doesn't get them a uh, this doesn't get them a Giro invite. Doesn't get yeah. them a Vuelta invite. And then Tour de France, the invitees are. It's between the. You know, X might get flicked. Tudor exists. Tudor as well, but I already said my piece on Tudor. I think hey, so we'll wait for them to be the auto wildcard in 26. Um, All because Tudor is sponsor of... No, because the store is sponsor of the Tour de France. Yeah, and maybe, and maybe Alif, yeah, but maybe also Tudor want Philippe to do their sponsored race in the Giro and not the Tour. So Tudor to double after doing LBL? If there's no Philippe, why would you Easy give Tudor the wildcard? Yeah, I yeah. agree. But uh, I don't know. Well, to be honest, Benji, I feel like every season, the last three years, oh, that's not true. Roglic did move. But I feel like Roglic, there was like no rumors really. And then bang, Roglic has gone to Bora. And we're like, okay, that's happened. Wow. But We spent half the offseason talking about an inexistent merger between Quickstep and... Was it Visma? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah Quickstep. <laughs> but that's what I mean. The, the heavily rumored stuff, Remco leaving. Are you so yeah. Peacock? I I get the feeling none of it. It, it just it doesn't happen in is the it? end. It's just too difficult. It's just too difficult to make it work. Is it because when it takes too long, 
agents or people involved start leaking things to the press to to hope that it forces the closure yeah. of the deal while in a shorter deal like with Roglic it was clear after the Vuelta that something was off but was it clear enough for a, a departure no but it did happen I I swear uh, I think I was I was driving through the Eurostar tunnel that day or something and I swear in the morning there was the rumor and by the evening a half of Twitter had figured out that it might be Bora that he might be going to so and that it, it went very quickly and I swear on Monday or something three days out it was it was announced or something you know yeah that that was my that's my recollection of it last year is that we didn't even do an a reaction to the rumor pod we just reacted on the news as it happened um yeah. And maybe that's also just because, because we heard some rumors that it might be announced soon. So, <laughs> yeah, but and, and also there, the three parties it just all made sense. Bora wants someone yeah. who can win a Grand Tour. Well, he won one, didn't he? He just won the Vuelta. Yeah. Roglic wanted to lead the Tour de France as unfettered leader. Yeah, Bora could offer that plus money. Visma had a, an untenable situation and also didn't want to keep an unhappy rider and 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 have that. Fost Vester in 2025. So it just and was also, like, okay, we all agree, it all makes sense for everybody, let's do it. And also at the same time, there was the whole merger situation going on, so Remco might join a Visma merger, yeah, so Jesus. maybe they're making space, so it made even more sense in our head at that point. Yeah, but my feeling this season, or this off-season, that Remco, he's not moving, to me, that's very clear. Yeah, I, would I be... think at the end of next season is how I convey the feeling. Uh, Ayuso for sure is not, uh, and yeah. we'll see. I, I think the only ball in the air is, is yeah, that, that rumor that came from, from Freiber, but I, yeah. Freiber, as I said, he's generally pretty uh, well-informed before he tweets something like that. But, uh, the, sorry, go on. Go ahead. I was going to say there's also maybe the longest contract I've ever seen for a, uh, a U23 rider. Pablo Torres got a six-year deal with uh, UAE, so... In, it's not really a transfer. He's on their Devo team, UAE Gen Z. Six-year deal, 25 to 2030. He uh, set the climbing record on Colle de Finestra and took four minutes in the Tour Lavenir Queen stage, and uh, they've locked him up forever. What, what do you think about this sort of long deal for a 20-year-old? Oh, it's interesting, because on one end, on one end, I think it's good for the job security of cyclists to have stuff like this happen, but on the other end, it's also a a risk for both parties. It makes sense for UAE to see that performance and want to layer him in, but also a lot can happen between now and the end of that contract. He can have an injury. He could just not perform that anymore. Something could happen. That's possible. Now with UAE, we've seen mostly good things happen as a consequence of longer contracts. Maybe Camillo Andres uh, Ardia was, uh, was the one they didn't really got working, if I recall correctly, after Giro Next Gen. But then I also have the feeling from the riders' perspective, what if they get into a situation where they're going very fast and they feel like they don't get enough opportunities because of those ambitions and therefore they might be in a situation where, okay, why did I sign such a long contract when maybe I could be the leader of another World Tour team at that point? Like, Anuso, for example, might be thinking that, I don't know, at a certain point in the next, in the next two years. That's very possible. And... What is, I don't know where that's going to go. I feel like that's a bit of a different ride. It feels like more pure climber than, than uh, the other names we're given here. But there's, there's still risks on both sides. But I guess it's better than signing a junior to a seven-year contract, which it's only a matter of time at this point. I, I was wrong. He's not 20. He's 18 years old. He's turning uh, 19 in a month. On he's the basically of uh, He's barely out of junior. <laughs> So yeah, he's a first year U23. He wasn't a very, he wasn't that good a junior. Like, yeah, he wasn't that good. Um, but certainly, as a pure climber, did the best U23 climb performance ever in uh, in Tour de Lavenir. I would, I would say there is no risk for UAE. What's the risk? Okay. Because money, it's because like Lotto can't, spot? Lotto can't afford to do this with eighteen year old Dali. Correct. Because they can't afford the if it backfires to be paying maybe three years of the last three years of the six to a guy who's a bit rubbish. Yeah, but, but if Torres is no good, spot. yeah, I, I guess there's that. But they also have Michael Vink on the roster. With all due respect, 
Yeah, that's that's very true. I agree with um, you on that. So it's there's no real downside to UA. And if he's unhappy, yeah. he can't leave like I used so. So he's got to yeah. make the best of it or you can sell him for for a good profit. For him there's job security, but yeah, it's um But I don't I don't see the upside to him of the extra two years, I gotta say. I know he'll only be twenty five when it expires, yeah. but yeah, I don't see it. But I think we've got a final transfer, and that's me going to bed in about half a minute. So I'm sorry, but okay. we're going to have to end it here. Benji's been traveling all day. <laughs> we end the podcast here. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Join Cycling, as always. And uh, follow me on Instagram uh, at the Lantern Rouge to see updates of that on the story tomorrow. Uh, if Ooh. you've listened to it before then, I know a lot of you listen to us straight away. Have a, have a good sleep, Benji, and we'll, we'll see you with the recap of the Lombardia on Saturday. Until then, ciao.